Hello lovely people, this week I'm doing a video that I don't think I've ever done before and that's the uh, 10 best fiction books I read in 2020. First of all, the tiny apology, I have another cold, I'm going to try and keep it together and concise. I've never done a like best books I read in insert year here before because I find it so hard to like rank books, I couldn't tell you what my favourite book is at all. What I did this time is, because I feel like I had um, a noticeable increase of five star reads in 2020, I just went through my list of five star books and I've just picked ten that stood out to me. This is ignoring the feelings I have about four star books that actually end up staying with me way longer than I expect them to and that sort of stuff. It's also not ranked, I'm just going to go through these in the order in which I read them throughout the year. Um, because <laughs> the thought of picking just one of them to be my best is impossible. So I'm just going to kick things off. The first book will be a surprise to no one because I don't shut up about it. It's the first season by N.K. Jemisin. I debated which one of the books from the Broken Earth trilogy to include. I thought I'd go for the first one because the first one is the one that really hooked me. I did also really love the rest of the series. This is, as I've talked about to death, a sci-fi fantasy series about this world where you have these seasons which are sort of like, um, big natural disasters and stuff like this that um, kind of like bring life to a halt and um, people have adapted to sort of be able to try and survive them. There are also these people who can sort of like control the earth and stuff like this. Um, this was just a book that really blew my socks off, reminded me of why I love reading sci-fi and fantasy. It felt so um, unique and different. I really loved the process of, um, because there are three different perspectives in this, the process of as you read it, you're gaining understanding, your understanding of how these perspectives will eventually like converge, and then particularly the ending of this particular book is one that really like gripped me and I was like okay I'm gonna read this very very soon so this is just a series that I absolutely adored this year for sure. Next up is The Gift of Rain by Tan Tuan Eng. I read this during the Asian Readathon this year. I had an absolutely amazing time taking part in that readathon. I feel like I read some really great books in general but this one really stood out to me. This starts in Penang in 1939. We follow this boy called Philip. He's half English, half Chinese. He kind of feels like he doesn't really belong to sort of like either group. Um, and this kind of is essentially throughout the, the process, you're sort of looking at the Japanese occupation of Malaysia during World War II. Really the heart of this is about Philip's relationship with Endo, who is this Japanese man who is living on the island. Um, they bond by uh, Endo teaching him Akaido, and then this, this tie that they have together, sort of, especially during this occupation, really kind of, um, not co kind of compromises them both in some ways, like um, the personal ties you have to people that sort of bring with them obligations and stuff like this, how do they conflict with the obligations you have to the other people in your life that you care about and stuff like this. Um, I just loved everything about this. I thought it was so beautifully written. It is a um, point of view on World War II that I've never read before, so I found it very educational. I also really enjoyed um, because of the different characters in this, you get um, glimpses into Chinese history, glimpses into Japanese history, as well as Malaysian history. Um, and I just, I thought it was absolutely beautiful, and it made me weep. <laughs> After that is Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo. I know everyone has been loving this book, and I think it's deservedly so. This follows, I think it's 12, it's been a while, 12 perspectives. Um, most of them are black British women, there is a non-binary perspective as well, and um, it's sort of one of these, um, the form is very continual and flowing, there's not like full stops and stuff like that. So it was very much a book that I um, sort of immersed myself into quite intensely, and I think that that really benefited my reading experience. I think that if I'd had to like read it in stops and spurts it might not have worked quite so well for me, but because I really got to sit with it. Um, it just, I felt so immersed and I really enjoyed this sort of like multiplicity of experience because all of these perspectives tie into each other in lots of different myriad ways. They sort of centre around this one event, but the ties that these people have um, vary in intensity and stuff like that. And I just loved this sort of... Um, glimpsing all the characters from all the different points of views and people's understandings of themselves versus how other people view them and stuff like this. Just this real like um, interconnectedness of what are the similar experiences that tie these people together? How are their lives been so wildly different? Um, and just that whole like multiplicity of experience when you are a person who interacts with other people in life. I just found it really well done and I uh, just absolutely loved it. 
After that is Where the Mountain Meets the Moon by Grace Lynn. This is such a sweet children's book. This follows Min Lee, who lives in the Valley of the Fruitless Mountain. Um, essentially, her family are very poor, um, but her father tells her all these wonderful stories. And so one day she decides that she's going to go find the old man of the moon and she's going to ask him how she can bring good fortune to her family. And so she sets off on this little mission. Um, she meets this dragon, they become friends. This for me was just like such a gorgeous piece of children's writing. There's much about this that feels very like simple but in a way that you know is very like masterfully and purposefully crafted so um it reminded me a lot of like uh you know like uh, storytelling traditions and that sort of thing the way that it is very much made to be read aloud there are stories within this so there are stories that are told as part of the story and they're formatted in a way where they have like their own headers and um you know i just loved the way that language was very purposefully being given to you in quite a simple straightforward manner but um that was evocative of these like storytelling um methods and stuff like that there were also really lovely illustrations throughout this is just one of those books that is sweet and heartwarming and delightful and has some wonderful like imagination and imagery in it and it's just one that I think would be just an absolute delight to read with a child. Obviously I've not been seeing my nibblings this year very much because pandemic but it made me want to like read this to them as bedtime stories and stuff like that it was just wonderful. <laughs> Next up is The Black Flamingo by Dean Atter. This is a novel in verse. We follow Michael he is uh, half Cypriot half black and he's growing up in the UK and this is sort of about him like finding himself um accepting his sexuality accepting who he is the sort of um you know like disagreements with friends feeling disconnected from like um family and culture and that sort of stuff like finding who you are and your place and your voice i just this is another one that made me cry <laughs> One thing I really liked about this is because this is told in verse, but equally Michael writes poetry. And I just thought that in that ability to make that distinction between like verse narrative and then like poetry that is like character expressing themselves, I thought that was done really well. This is another one that I devoured in like a day and I really appreciated just being able to sit with it and read it. And I just thought it was really wonderful and I'm so pleased that like young people who are finding themselves have books like this that they can read and like see themselves and their journey and that sort of thing in and I just thought it was really wonderful and I cried. <laughs> After that is Gods of Jade and Shadow by Silvia Moreno Garcia. This was my first Silvia Moreno Garcia but it will not be my last. This follows Cassiopeia Tun. It's set in 1920s Jazz Age Mexico. After the death of her father, she sort of spent her whole life being like a servant for um, her grandfather's family. One day, she like unleashes this death god and then um, they go on this journey together because this death god and his brother are in this struggle. And I loved so much about this. I thought that the descriptions were absolutely beautiful. This is one of those books that I wanted to devour, but I made myself slow down and only read it in like small chunks because I really wanted to savour it. So um, the colours, the, the way the um I don't know like the sensory experience of reading these descriptions was just delightful I just I really loved Cassiopeia as a main character I felt like um you know she spends this whole book really just trying to find freedom and the awareness that freedom can be temporary and can be taken from you and if you have freedom what do you choose to do with that and that sort of thing like I felt like these were really like compelling things for her to be considering and wrestling with and that sort of thing a lot of the time when I read like fantasy-esque books that also have like a love story in I think the love story is perfectly fine Fine, but I'm like, eh, this one really got me. And <laughs> I was like, oh, the feelings, I've got them. So um, this was just really wonderful and I absolutely loved it. Next up is a graphic novel. This is On a Sunbeam by Tilly Walden. I have to thank Bryony from the Indecisive Readers because she sent me this for my birthday because she was like, it hits your buzzwords. I think you'll love it. And then I did. Because it's like, gaze in space, found family. And I was just like, um, hello. I love Tilly Walden's art style in general. I just think she has such a gorgeous um, a way with colour and a way with specifically like black. She uses a lot of black in her art, as you can see, and I think it's really effective. And I think that the way that colour was used throughout this shows so much about like emotion and that sort of thing. But this really was the like found family space romp that I just it gets me. It like puts these little hooks in my heart, and I just I love it so. Um, I just I love what she does 
with little words. Um, I had that, when I read I Love This Part years and years ago, that's a really small um, graphic novel by her that has very minimal text in it. And I think she used that, all of the words she used were used very carefully. And I always sort of feel that with her. I feel like she uses dark space very carefully and I feel like she chooses her words very carefully. And I just, I loved this so much. And it was a reminder to me to buy and read everything that Tilly Walden has written. The final three books will be no surprise if you've watched my December wrap ups. I don't know if my second wrap up has gone live yet or not, but it will be this week if it's not already. I'll link down below. So the first one of these final three I have to talk about is Legendborn by Tracy Dion. I loved this so much. Again, I have to thank Bryony because she was like, this is such a great book. And then I read it and I was like, it really fucking is. I love King Arthur retellings. It's a topic I'm going to be exploring in 2021 further. This had such a wonderful like dialogue going on whereby it's not retelling, but it's sort of um, reimagining the legacy of. And I really liked that. I loved how um, Bree's trauma, both her um, particular trauma from her, the passing of her mother and then also the intergenerational trauma that comes from being um, the descendant of enslaved people, um, were given like time and space and compassion to be explored. I loved the way that like the legacy of the Arthurian myth was really examined in this. Brie walks through life um, on a campus that has links to slavery and so this secret society of the Order of the Round Table that she ends up becoming involved with it's not a surprise that like they also have links with slavery and like the legacy of that is really explored. I loved Brie as a heroine. She is like simultaneously like so strong but also allowed to be vulnerable. Um, I just... <laughs> I'm not going to babble on incessantly. I'll link where I, the video where I talk about this down below so you can get my full, full thoughts. But this was just wonderful and really has kickstarted that Arthurian exploration moment for me, which I loved. Um, penultimately is Piranesi by Susanna Clarke. This is a very weird book that I think um, some people really won't get on with, but I really loved. And I loved the like process of reading this book. This follows Piranesi, who lives in this house full of all these chambers that are like full of statues and arches and there's these tides that come and go. It's a very weird but beautiful place to imagine and every week he meets the other and then they talk and the other is shadier than Piranesi might think. And essentially this book really unfolds like a journey of understanding and I really loved that process so I loved not knowing what was going on for a while because she has such beautiful description and imagery that the, the fact that I didn't really know the full picture didn't bother me because I was so immersed in imagining what this place looked like and all of these sorts of things and trying to piece together from clues there's very much like a dialogue with like the magician's nephew C.S. Lewis happening um, there's probably a bunch of other things happening that I didn't pick up on because I've only read this one time and I definitely want to reread this more than once but suffice to say I think that Susanna Clarke just has this really like wonderful way of creating worlds like compare this to Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell they're so different but to me they both like excite me um, I just loved it. Uh, the final one of my best books of 2020 is A Spark of White Fire by Sangin Mandana. I love this so much and I so desperately need to get my hands on the second book. This is a sci-fi series that is inspired by the Mahabharata and other Indian mythology and um, we follow this girl called Esme who has been Essentially, she's the secret twin sister of this guy called Alexei, who is supposed to have inherited the throne of this planet called Kali, but his uncle has, like, taken the throne instead. She was uh, exiled as a baby um, because there's this curse that she will bring ruin to her brother and her family. So she's been raised in secret on this other planet, and then where this starts, she is sort of stepping up to reclaim her identity, and this has a lot of... Um, political machinations, which is wonderful, a sentient spaceship, which was brilliant, like this real, like, epic level of, like, emotion and fate and that sort of thing, but really grounded in this, like, human level of, like, the bonds between people and human infallibility and all this sort of thing. I thought the presence of gods in this was so wonderful. I essentially loved everything about this, very much like this. These are the types of sci-fi that make my heart sing and that I just adore with every fibre of my being. So um, if you love like sweeping space operas, if you love like mythology inspired things, I just think this is so good. I loved it so much. 
Um, I just also wanted to give a tiny honourable mention to Blue Horses by Mary Oliver. It's poetry, so I wasn't sure whether to include it in fiction, but I did just want to briefly mention it because this poetry collection really soothed me at a time when I really needed that. Um, there's a lot of um, acknowledging one's place in the world. This is a collection that was written when Mary Oliver was an older woman um, while she was going through cancer treatment and stuff like this and so there's a real like reflection in this. Like, there's a real like nature imagery going on in here that I found so soothing and just that this was a really gorgeous collection that I feel like I'm going to return to time and time again and so I just wanted to tack it on the end. Um, that's it, those are my 10 books slash 11 books that I wanted to talk about. I would love to know if you've also read any of these, if you have any thoughts on them please do let me know, or what your best books of 2020 were. I'm gonna do another one of these for non-fiction I'm hoping, um, hopefully that will be up either next week or the week after depending when I have time to film it. That's everything I wanted to talk about this week, I hope you're having a really lovely day and I will see you next time for something different.